Hey there, listeners. Corey from the Being Boss team here. I have a quick question for you. Do you want to get more out of what we do here at Being Boss? Sure, you like this podcast, but did you know that Emily is recording monthly episodes of Making a Business, the show that follows along as she builds her other business, Almanac Supply Co.? These episodes are available exclusively to members of the Being Boss Clubhouse, along with business workshops, industry-specific virtual meetups for designers and product bosses, and more. Learn more and sign up for the Bing Boss Clubhouse at bingboss.club slash community. Welcome to Being Boss, a podcast for creatives, business owners, and entrepreneurs who want to take control of their work and live life on their own terms. I'm your host, Emily Thompson, and in this episode, I'm joined by Jessie Susanna Carnatz, The Money Witch, to talk about her new book, Money Magic, as well as tips for healing your finances and the intersection of money and spirituality. You can find all the tools, books, and links we reference on the show notes at www.beingboss.club. And if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to this show and share us with a friend. In my experience, creatives struggle with sales. You're great at what you do, but you have a hard time talking about it, especially in sales-focused conversations. If this is you, then I have your next podcast recommendation for you. The Salesman Podcast hosted by Will Barron, brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network. If you want to learn how to sell, the Salesman Podcast will teach you how to find buyers and win business in effective and, my favorite, ethical ways. Some of Will's latest episodes include the four-step process to influencing buying decisions, using strategy rather than hustle to win more sales, and sales targeting, supercharge your sales funnels, and boost close rates. Check out this show and get better at selling what you do. Listen to the Salesman Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Jessie Susanna Carnatz, aka The Money Witch, brings capitalism-critical, shame-free education to healers, hustlers, and creatives in order to catalyze change in their financial lives. She believes healing our finances will bring blessings to our lives, our lineages, and our communities. She offers education, money management products, and intuitive financial coaching online and in the Bay Area on unceded Ohlone land, and does it all with impeccable business lady style. Jessie, Susanna, welcome to Being Balls. I am so glad you're here. Thank you so much for the invitation. I am excited about this conversation. You just sort of popped into Zoom and you were like, I think we've maybe done like seen, met something before. And I was like, I maybe feel this too, but neither of us can decide where or when this may have happened. I'm thinking this is going to be a really engaging conversation. Yeah, there must be some kind of connection there. Maybe so. Who knows? The world or the the sort of spheres we we run in are so interconnected. I, I find that oftentimes with bosses that I that I bring on to the show, and you know, we like we pop in and out of each other's feeds or, or you know, blogging threads or whatever. Um, and you never quite know. But I I'm so excited to have you on the show. I saw recently that you had a book coming out, and I was like, it's time. It's time to to have this chat. Yeah, March 1st was the release of my book, Money Magic, and I've just been thrilled to have it out ever since. It's been um, a really fun celebration. I bet. Writing a book, releasing a book baby into the world is such a creative endeavor, and then letting it out into the world, um, letting it sort of take on a life of its own. It is definitely worth celebrating. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you about your book today and really just the concept behind it, this idea of money magic. So I think to get us started, um, actually to get us really started, I'd love for you to share more about your entrepreneurial story. So get us started with telling us how it is you got to where you are today. It is so meandering. <laughs> As it, uh, that's all the best stories thing. are. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, I'm one of those people. It's like, if I'm going to tell a story, I want to tell the whole story, which my first job 
or my first business ever was selling Jolly Ranchers at school, but um, which I is more on my mind these days because I have a 12 year old who also has a little school business. Oh, nice. But in my 20s, um, I spent most of my 20s working um, in strip clubs. And as a dancer, you're really like, you know, you are a solopreneur yeah. because you are sort of, you know, you're managing your own money, you're managing your own taxes, you're managing your own workflow. Um, and I learned a lot about the exchange of money in those years. And then about halfway through that, I was working at a peep show in San Francisco called The Lusty Lady, which was like kind of um, an iconic spot because it was one of the only successful unionization efforts in the sex work industry in the United States. Um, I mean, still to this day. And so uh, we were a union shop and the owners of the business uh, laid us all off like they were going to close down the shop. And because we were already an organized workforce who had you know, plenty of experience at being like, this place would be so much better if we were just running it. We bought it as a worker-owned cooperative. So I was on the founding board of directors of that um, business. And, you know, I learned a lot. This was uh, 2004, I think. It was either 2004, 2005. So, you know, it's like we were like, yeah, sure, we can buy this million dollar business, you know, just by reading advice on the Internet. Let's do it. <laughs> um, yep. And that's exactly what we did. So um, I I was on the board of directors there for several years. I was in a position that was essentially kind of like lead HR uh, for several years. And I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned a lot, um, you know, because in a club like this was like hundreds of employees it was like I hired hundreds of people I fired you know tens of people um there's a lot of movement and turnover and drama and all those things so um I then got involved more deeply in the worker-owned co-op community and was working just like in the Bay Area there's a strong network for that and I started to kind of see just how sad it was that there was like so many really passionate people that were, you know, excited about different ways of being in economy, but, you know, different ways of being in business. And we're actually like putting that in practice and really like dedicating, you know, their life force to this. And there was so much financial scarcity. And there was also so much lack in terms of financial professionals that had the cultural competency to work within the worker co-op community, you know, and not to mention the sex work community as well. Right. So I was kind of like up close and personal witnessing these alternative business communities where there just wasn't a lot of relevant financial advice. So a friend at the time and I took sort of took it upon ourselves. She was doing some bookkeeping. She was also very involved in worker co-ops. And we started a business in 2008 uh, to do taxes, bookkeeping, and kind of like financial consulting for worker-owned, you know, co-ops, but also individuals who worked in worker-owned co-ops and also, you know, pulling over people from uh, who worked in the sex industry as well. So um, that business was awesome. Like it was very well, uh, crafted. And that was my sort of first experience at creating a business from the ground up, like all the marketing concepts and, you know, a brick and mortar space and all the things that go along with that. Unfortunately, that business did not last very long, uh, due to like intense business partner conflict, which I'm sure your community has a lot of experience and for sure to on that topic <laughs> um you know so it's it's a partnership right and it's not always it doesn't always work out so um ours did not and also I got pregnant I was pretty sick I had pretty bad you know quote-unquote morning sickness which we all know lasts all day um for about four months and I just I don't know. I just was like, okay, this is closing. This door is closing. So I went into a few years of parenting 
pretty much full time. I was continuing to do a little bit of taxes, a little bit of consulting, just, you know, for friends. And in 2012, we got evicted from our house, which, you know, in San Francisco, I live in San Francisco in the Bay Area. It's very common, these kind of like no fault evictions that are for real estate, uh, you know, economic purposes. Mm -hmm. And we got evicted. I decided to get divorced. And all of a sudden I was like, I need a job. I have an almost three-year-old. I'm a single mother who hasn't worked in years and has a very eclectic work history. Um, and I'm living in one of the most expensive places on earth. And I've just kind of got to figure this out. So there was a number of different paths that I attempted to tread, but I was very divinely like shut down from all of them. There's a, there's a story. It's in the book. That's sort of the intro to my books. Like how, how did I become the money witch? Um, and sort of goes into all these options that I was exploring. And then finally I was like, you know, I do know how to have a business. And at the end of the day, I am a person who, you know, wants to do things my own way, like wants to, you know, be the mastermind behind the situation. So let me just see how viable this will be. And I started two businesses at that time. Uh, one was a postpartum doula practice because that is something I also do have training for. And the other was Money Witch. And uh, postpartum doula was fine, but that's a tough hustle. And Money Witch just really, there was a lot of responsiveness. So I am always someone who follows the path that is opening in front of me and, you know, really listen to like the spirit world and trust that like my angels and my ancestors are guiding me where I need to go. So I just followed the path and, you know, eight or so years later, here we are. Oh, it, it, the best stories are windy, right? They, um, <laughs> they, and, and they're the ones where you do exactly what you're saying of you follow the doors that are opening in front of you, right? You, you sort of have mm -hmm. many skills, many opportunities, and you just go where there is response and opportunity and, you know, a, a bit of passion, <laughs> Uh, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a couple of questions for you. <laughs> because it sounds like it, it sounds like this money piece the, or the question for you. Do you mm -hmm. have any traditional education in finances or money management? Mm -hmm. I have a certificate in microcomputer accounting um, from City College in San Francisco. And so that was when we were um, my first business partner and I in 2008, when we decided we wanted to start that business, she already was working as a bookkeeper. And bookkeeping is something that is generally uh, sort of taught in a like apprentice style, you know, where you'll start working for someone mm -hmm. and they have clients already and, you know, you kind of, they show you how to do it. So she, I kind of apprenticed under her a little bit. And then we both decided we would go uh, take this certificate program where, you know, you take several classes on taxes and you take classes on bookkeeping and you take, you know, whatever, it's like 10 classes or something like that. Sure. So that was that. And then in California, in order to be a tax preparer, you have to sit through like a 60 hour um, education program and take tests and exams and get certified by the state. And then every year you have to, you know, take a certain amount of continuing education to recertify. So now um, that's been, I think, 11 years, maybe I've been a certified tax preparer. Um, so I've done that education every year. So that's, it's very self-taught. I, I have a number of like random degrees. I also have a culinary degree. Um, nice. <laughs> and I've started recently, I know, I've started uh, personal financial planning, which is like a graduate certificate program at uh, UCLA Extension because I don't do financial planning, um, but I am interested in, in it conceptually and kind of like adding the philosophical points and the tools to the skill set that I already have. Perfect. Okay. What I love most about this is that you really got those first pieces of, you know, uh, technical education after you discovered that you sort of had this vision of the money side of business and you even like took steps to 
start a business focusing on the money side. And I bring this up because in my experience with creative business owners who, you know, are the crowd who are listening to this, um, money is something that is, is like pulling teeth, right? Like dealing with the money side and you were able to sort of pinpoint kind of early on that this was a lens through which you were looking at the world that was different from how the people who were around you were doing it. So I would love to really dive into dive into dive into that difference. Mm-hmm. You know, you were involved with this worker co-op. You saw that there was some money issues everywhere. Everywhere. (laughs) Right? Mm -hmm. And you saw that there was a a place where you could assist them in this just from an innate knowing, right, that you had inside of you. Um, So your experience with money or finances or, you know, really looking at business from, from that side of things, what do you think made you different from everyone who wasn't seeing it? I don't know. That's a fantastic question. I think, okay. I think, um, <laughs> you know, I'm a numbers person, right? So I've been doing bookkeeping and, you know, I, mm-hmm. I am a math person. So I think there's an aspect of that, that is always just present for me. You know, when people are talking about things, in terms of a business, I'm just like always have that little math calculator going like this doesn't add up, you know, <laughs> like, is this going to add up? Yeah. <laughs> the, you know, it's going to the cost benefit analysis. And um, I just see the numbers. I'm very in touch with the numbers. I feel like in a spiritual sense, as well as just there must be something about my brain that just really like that bottom line is important to me because um, and, you know, coming from that, the sort of alternative business community, right, we're all familiar with the idea of multiple bottom lines, right? Like, it's like finance can't be the only bottom line. But it's important for small business people to remember that it is definitely one of the major bottom lines, right? Like, you're allowed to have a hobby, you know, and if you are deciding you're going to do something for business, then the point is it needs to make you money. It needs to support your life, support you materially, like on this earth journey. And you need to understand how to assess and read the terrain of finance you know, so that you can know if where you're going is going to support that for you or not. And you need to be able to navigate, you know, the tools of finance, right? Like reading a profit and loss statement or knowing what the tax, you know, deduction categories are or um, knowing what receipts to keep or not, you know, those little things, right? So the kind of habits and tools that are also going to support you in that business terrain, those are absolutely essential skills as a small business person. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, perfect. Fascinating story. I absolutely love it. And I I love that you are speaking of this money, the money side of things from this place where it was just, it was so innate to, to how it is that you see the world. I think, um, I think it, it, it's special <laughs> to find someone like in our sphere who is so numbers oriented. Um, and it gives you this place from which you can share and, but, but share these concepts in a way that, you know, creative business owners understand, whereas most financial talk in the world is so over there slash our heads that how could we <laughs> take it and use it in our lives and businesses? Um, so I'm really excited to to dive in a bit further. HubSpot's CRM platform can help you kickstart your sales process, increase your leads, and stay connected with customers. Plus, it will scale with your business, making HubSpot the perfect tool for any creative business owner. Hear it from a real boss using HubSpot to grow their business. 
My name is Laura DeFranco. I'm the founder of Free Period Press, a Being Boss podcast fan and HubSpot CRM customer. It's really important to have a pulse on what's going on with our retail customers. I want to know how their customers are responding to our product, our prices, and what trends they're seeing in their shops. Even though we're working digitally, we're trying to keep our relationships as human as possible by developing real connections with store owners. We use HubSpot to track all of our wholesale accounts and prospects. We're honestly just scratching the surface in HubSpot's capabilities, but it's really nice to know that we're set up in a system that has the features we'll need as we grow. We track the contact information for all of our wholesale stockists and leads in HubSpot. There's so much data that we can add for each stockist, not just email and address, but any personal notes, the last time they ordered, or special requirements. When it's time to reach out to our accounts, we can filter so that we're sending more personalized messages to each store, and that is super helpful. My HubSpot CRM platform helps my business stay connected. Learn more about how it can do the same for yours at HubSpot.com. I want to talk a little bit, right? I want to talk a lot probably um, about your book, Money Magic, um, which did come out. It came out on March 1st, 2022. So it's fresh in the world. Um, I'd love to hear from you who or what inspired you to write this book. What is this book a culmination of? I would say, you know, my clients have inspired me to write this book and just the community of what you're just speaking, right? These people in the world, you know, that I love and care for who are doing incredible creative work, incredible spiritual work, incredible healing work, um, incredible community work, and are often not feeling that same competency and success reflected back to them in their financial life. And Mm -hmm. I really, it's, I don't know, it's a, it's a, it's a love, right? It's a form of love for me that I feel like I'm bringing, um, to the world, to anyone who needs it. Perfect. It reminds me when you were just, uh, speaking of like, you know, what is this lens? It really is kind of bringing me back. Like, you know, 15 years or so to when I was in that first uh, worker co-op and thinking about like, you know, why is it that I'm so focused on finances versus other people in the situation? And I think it really ties into exactly what I would say is the inspiration for this book as well, which is that I see the lack of money or, you know, when things become less and less profitable. Like I feel like in the worker co-op community, I saw that a lot where things would kind of become less and less financially viable. Maybe the, you know, original investment is getting spent out or something changes where the business model isn't as profitable. And there starts to be this financial scarcity. People are kind of like cycling and cycling, trying to iterate um, and, and not necessarily doing it effectively. And it, feels so sad to me. Like it really hurts me to see that because these are the same people that I'm just speaking of, like incredibly gifted, incredibly special people who are here to walk like a path where they're bringing their gifts to the larger human community. And that life force is just kind of being sucked out by it not being met with like enough material support to function and thrive. And I just don't want to see people go through that anymore. I love that mission a hundred percent. As you're talking about that, I'm definitely, it's resonating with me so much as to what I have seen from so much of the creative community. I think you hit the nail right on the head. This, this, um, separation between the work and the effort and the mission and the quality and the value, and then literally what's in their bank account and finding a way to lessen that gap to, to make the two meet is quite the worthy cause. Thank you for taking it on. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Perfect. So the positioning for this book and so much of what you do is centered around this idea of healing your finances. 
It's part of the subtitle of the book, which the title of the full title of the book is Money Magic, Practical Wisdom and Empowering Rituals to Heal Your Finances. So this idea of healing your finances is fascinating to me. Um, But I think we sort of have to start with this question of what's wrong with our finances. I think you just hit on that a little bit, but (laughs) I'd love for to hear you um, flesh that out a little bit more. What have you seen is, is wrong with the state of our finances currently? I think there's two ways that we could come at this. So one is that idea, exactly what you're asking, like what's wrong that needs to be healed, right? Like there needs to be an Mm -hmm. injury. And it's funny because I never really thought about it that way. And um, the original proposed title of my book was Heal Your Finances because that is a major, that's the entire premise of my work. And the publisher was like, we can't, sell a book called Heal Your Finances because people can't gift it to other people without implying that something is wrong with them and their finances. Well, passive aggressive if you need to be. (laughs) Exactly. They're paying you guys the big bucks. I would never think about that. But, um, you know, it kind of alerted me to like, in a way, we live in a, a sort of healing phobic society, right? Like, oh, to say someone needs to heal something is Mm. um, almost like an insult or something. So if we take it from that approach, like what is the injury? Like, is there a direct injury? I would say, you know, so every, all of this is based in my spiritual beliefs. My spiritual belief is, you know, you are incarnated into your body at a particular point in space time and you're here for a reason. So All of us who are, you know, reading my book, we are gathered together in this moment that is based on, um, you know, colonialism, that is based on predatory global capitalism. We are in a very stressful point in economic existence, right? So there's little injuries that happen all of the time, you know, every day, right? When we have to like work harder than we should, right? When we're not respected in our workplaces, when we're dealing with, um, you know, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, racism in our workplace, when we are, um, you know, forced to pay exorbitant rent in, you know, places that have been gentrified, things like that, right? Like those are all little injuries. Um, Even people in the United States, I think, uh, particularly white people who are in um, position of having like a lot of money and many generations of wealth, like a lot of that generational wealth is accumulated through violence. So that is a source of injury and it lives in your lineage and it lives in your DNA and in your psyche around money, right? So I think that there is very few people, I can't imagine anybody, but there's very few people alive on this moment on the planet that are not kind of getting a rough, uh, a rough financial existence that don't already have a rough, you know, aren't getting a little like some scrapes and bruises. So those are the like direct injuries. The other lens would be to say that we exist, like we're born, you know, with an evolutionary purpose. And part of that purpose is to take a particular journey with a particular curriculum. And we evolve through that. And that evolution is a form of healing. We are healing in our lineages. We're healing in our families. We are, you know, all of us healing some type of trauma, right? Like an undigestible experience from our childhood. And that's just part of the job of being human. And for me and my lens, because I'm such a like healing centric person, I feel like that's one of the predominant purposes of of being alive, of human existence. So I don't think of it as like something that is wrong in order to be healing. It's more like healing is a form of evolution. Mm, I love that. What, oh, better way of seeing it. And I also really love that you're touching on this idea that is humans alive in what the world is right now. Every single one of us is carrying some sort of bit of financial 
um, baggage that needs to be addressed, whether you are filthy rich or incredibly poor, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> Full spectrum. We're all a little messed up when it comes to our finances. And so we all have some healing to do around it. Mm -hmm. And it mm. made me, I like this kind of pulling apart of, you know, heal your finances because it makes me realize it could also be called, you know, wisdom and rituals to evolve your finances, to mature your finances, to, you know, just like find peace within your finances. Yes. Oh, I'm loving this notion of evolution and finances because I do feel like that is what that's what's really sort of being called on to happen right now, right? Like, where is, you know, global wealth coming from? Not from great places, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Where is a lot of our individual wealth coming from? Not from great places. Whenever you really sort of dig in and deeper in this idea of evolving, if we can evolve the situations around our personal wealth, that sort of ripples outward. And as we do that, we sort of engage a healing in the entirety of economy that just feels very pie in the sky fabulous. Exactly. Like when we do this work, you know, we contribute that healing to our families, our partnerships, our communities, and to the larger human community, right? Like we are much more able to show up in these challenges, these communal challenges that, you know, we're just in, right? Like we are in a set of communal challenges. And, and I know that everybody who's listening like cares you know they care about being able to show up in in whatever kind of individual way to a solution a healing an evolution an addressing of these challenges and what really stops us from being able to do that is how preoccupied we are with our own individual mess, injuries, you know, wounds, dramas, right? Unresolved issues. So when we really face the issues, acknowledge that they're there, address them directly, put language to them and think about what we need to do to get some, some shifts, some movement, some change, you know, all words that mean healing to me, then it's like, okay, we're fortified to go out and contribute to the larger human community. Beautiful. Everyone, go do some healing of your finances. It's for an incredibly good cause. That <laughs> that just lit some fires under me that I did not even know weren't lit yet. Um, that's that's wonderful. I'd love to dive maybe a little bit deeper into well, one the book, but also just generally what you do because. You know, as the money witch and in your book, Money Magic, you are pairing this very practical, like financial advice and experience and like, you know, to do list, right? Or maybe not to do list, but these actions people can take with mystical rituals, which we are quite a fan of here. Um, at being boss. And I, I also love that you're meeting at the intersection of money and spirituality, which we have talked on the show many times before in the past that these two things are intrinsically linked. Um, and you are diving right into those things. So I think for most people listening, I think everyone listening, practical advice feels absolutely standard when it comes to, you know, talking money. Um, I would love to hear from you as to where you think the power lies in adding ritual to your money practices. I have this pyramid drawing in my book, and it's also on my website, and I call it the three angles of healing. So to me, if you want to heal or evolve or see gains or wins or, you know, however you feel comfortable phrasing it, right, on any issue, right, we're talking about money, this could be anything. I think if you address it from all three angles in parallel, right, it doesn't have to be exactly simultaneously, but in the same time period or make sure that you're tending to all three angles, then you're going to see the most movement on whatever it is that you're trying to heal or evolve. Um, and those are one logistical, practical, right? So that's what you're saying. Just, you know, the advice, the to-do list. Uh, get the knowledge, get some literacy, check it off the list. There's what I call emotional spiritual, 
which means what is going on for you personally, these, these wounds that we're talking about, right? Like what are the kind of hot topics in your personal history that are impacting your financial life? And I include spiritual in that because to me, spiritual is about your personal path of your spirit on this earth, right? So there's certain challenges that are a part of your personal spirit path. And then the third angle is magical energetic. So magical energetic to me, like what magic means to me is taking responsibility for yourself as an energetic entity and then acknowledging which at this point, I feel like that's just science, right? Like we're reading that all the time, you know, with physics and et cetera, right? Like we're energetic beings. We have impact on the environment around us. And if we're able to impact the environment directly around us, we are therefore able to impact more largely as well. And then we're acknowledging that everyone else and everything else has an energetic power as well. So for example, you know, I know that your crowd is very familiar with crystals, right? So, and in the book, every chapter of my book has a couple crystal friends, like I call them allies that you could work with to do like the work of that chapter. Because to me, that's working that magical energetic angle of healing is saying, you know, yeah, okay, I am going to do my bookkeeping on time for all of this year. You know, I'm going to make sure that I'm uh, keeping up to date on it and I'm going to notice maybe on the emotional side that I do have a tendency, tendency towards avoidance. Let me, you know, do some journaling or talk in therapy about like, why am I avoiding this? Because that's going to help you be more successful in showing up to the bookkeeping rather than just beating yourself up about like, oh, why can't I do my bookkeeping? You know, but then remembering that third angle, like, you know what, I have magical ability because I have energy. I have an energetic capacity. And so if I put my energetic weight on it with intention in a direction, then I am going to have impact. And then maybe I can ask for assistance from some energetic allies, right? So that could be a crystal, that could be a plant, that can be you know, a, an angel that can be um, any kind of tarot archetype or something like that, right? But when you remember that your sphere of agency and your sphere of impact is not just, you know, the practical actions and checking things off your to-do list, but your sphere of agency increases when you also work in these additional realms. I love this so much because <laughs> what you are describing here is really the three points of a more holistic approach to all the things that we've talked about. Because as you're saying this, I can absolutely think of scenarios where I've had, I've been coaching bosses or, you know, listening in on Monday meetups in the community or whatever, and someone has, you know, done one but is still struggling. So, you know, maybe they're showing up mm -hmm. and doing the practical stuff all day, every day, and nothing's working, but they still have really awful money mindsets, right? The emotions that they have around money are not being addressed. They're just showing up and doing the work. And if anything, probably driving them like further into the hole mm -hmm. because they're really it's creating shame. For right? sure. Like when you so do many the negative things. and it doesn't work, you're like, yeah. oh, there's something wrong with me, you yep. know? And and when you don't take the time to get specific, I'm like, yeah, there is something wrong with you. You know, yeah. I mean, not wrong with you, but, you know, there's a challenge there, right? Like there's, yep. a, there's an injury, there's a wounding there. There's something present there with you, do, you know, that is like asking to be heard. And when you don't take the time to actually listen to it and sort it out, then it's just sort of this general inkling like, oh, there's something wrong with me. And then we lump it under this sort of umbrella category, which is shame. And then we just feel like, well, I'll never be able to do this. It leads to more avoidance or it leads to, you know, lessening self-esteem, all those things that then make it even harder to show up for the practical things that you're showing up for. Yes. And then you add on top of this, this sort of um, magical energetic piece. Let's say you have shown up and you, you're doing the practical work. 
right? You have also added on this idea of addressing whatever sort of inner situation, whatever blocks you need to work on to help make this, this practical thing work, but you're still not getting anywhere because, you know, your surroundings are, you know, full of things that make you unhappy or you're not focusing other parts of your energy on this as well. Um, I absolutely can pinpoint multiple times that I've seen this be the case as well, where on the outside, it looks like you're doing everything right. But if you're not sort of including, I guess, like your soul on the journey, right? Um, Mm -hmm. then, Then you're still not quite there yet. And so I love that this, this pyramid that, that you've identified really does pull together all three pieces of this and gives a pretty simple structure for for really holistically going at, I guess, any goal that you may have. Totally. And we've all seen people who spend time in one of those other angles and don't get to the logistical practical as well, right? Like, it's like you can light your money candle and be like, I want my business to make, you know, a million dollars. And then it's like, but are you doing your bookkeeping? No. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like you yeah. have to, you really do have to hit them all. And it doesn't have to be that pressure of like every day I need to be doing all of these things, you know, but kind of that idea of like, you know, is there just looking like at that little pyramid, like, is there one of these angles that I'm really just, you know, need to kind of get in and spend some time in that I, you know, I'm going really hard in this these other two pieces, but here is a place where I'm like, yeah, not necessarily showing up for the process. Boss, let's get real. Are you still struggling with managing the money side of your business? These days with tools and tips and me driving it right into your ear holes, there's really not much excuse for you to not have this under wraps. So let's go back to the tools. Our friends at FreshBooks have made this about as easy for you as it can be. FreshBooks has everything you need to manage your books. Invoices, expenses, time tracking. It'll even send out automatic reminders for invoices and fix you up with late fees when a client doesn't pay on time, which means it's also here to ease the pain of having those awkward conversations when necessary. What more can you want? If you're determined to do your own money management or just are not ready to hand it off yet, stop messing around and go check out FreshBooks. Try FreshBooks free for 30 days, no credit card required by going to freshbooks.com slash being boss to get started today. One of the things I've joked around or joked about here on the show, and very specifically, I I have a weekly mastermind group called the C-Suite in the community. And one of the things that we've sort of coined over there is this idea of of holistic capitalism. And I think that we've just added um, a reference for for Mm -hmm. our education on holistic capitalism, because that's exactly sort of a model that you've given us here for, for going after those things and achieving the things that you want to achieve, but doing it in a true holistic way so that you are sort of serving, um, I guess, like physical, emotional and energetic realms, um, which is, is so key. I've never heard it quite like that. Um, but it even just clicked in my head in a totally new and different way. So I appreciate that. Fabulous. (laughs) Perfect. So I would love to hear from you. And this can either be maybe your favorite example from the book, or maybe it's something that you were not able to add into the book. Because I think the practical stuff we get, right? Like do your bookkeeping, invoice your clients, you know, collect the money, count it, Mm -hmm. spend it where appropriate. Like we get that more or less. Um, What about this ritual side? Can you give us an example of a money ritual um, that will give us a look at what this um, sort of magical energetic part of this pyramid may include? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a real easy one that, you know, I love. And I, I don't think it's in the book, it might be in there just sort of as a casual mention, every chapter of the book. uh, So the book is built off a seven step system to heal your finances, right? Like I kind of lay out the whole structure of the technology of how you could do that. And every chapter, as I said, it opens with uh, this kind of toolbox, energetic, uh, magical toolbox that has um, an astrological archetype, a tarot archetype, um, a cup of tea made of herbs that I think could support you, the crystals. And then every chapter finishes with a ritual. 
So we kind of start and begin, uh, bookend, I guess, each chapter with the magical aspect of it. And I don't think this one made it in that context. They might be mentioned somewhere else. And it's a really simple thing that, you know, any of us that have been kind of involved in, you know, money and magic in any way have definitely heard of before, but it's always a good reminder, which is the ritual of like writing yourself a check from the universe. Um, and I think it's a good one because it's a pretty accessible ritual. It doesn't take a lot of time, but the idea is that you would take, um, you know, you can kind of buy these checks online. Uh, they kind of very rampant in like law of attraction communities. You can draw one. I know you have so many creators, right? You could draw or paint one. That's a really fun exercise. Um, you can use a check from your own checkbook, but I kind of like the idea that it doesn't come directly from your bank because the idea is that you are sort of getting paid from the bank of the universe, the bank of abundance. I used to have these play checks that I got at Party City that I love that said they were from the bank of fun. Um, I like to write myself <laughs> a check from the bank of fun yes. sometimes. So it could be from the bank of whatever. Um, but, you know, you're writing your name on the two line. And this can be done with a specific goal in mind, right? So maybe you are doing a launch and you're like, I want to hit this number with my launch. Okay, so you're going to do your ritual at the beginning of your launch and you're going to write this check, you know, with a certain date on it. And you're going to say, you know, from the universe, or maybe it's a goal for the year and you do it on January 1st. Um, it can also just be a check that you write that doesn't have a particular number attached to it. You can write paid in full in the numbers uh, line on your check. And it can just be a knowingness and a trust that like the money that you need will come to you. And as part of this ritual, you know, I would I would, let's just say, since we're a creative crowd, like drawing or painting the check is part of the ritual, right? So we've created this check. Maybe we've decorated it. I'm seeing like green watercolor paint. Yes. Uh, you know, maybe some like metallic pens, like whatever, you know, stickers, whatever you want. And then we've, you know, written it out. And this is a part of our ritual. And I would light a candle and put the check under the candle in a fire safe way, of course. Um, so, you know, there could be a dish in between, but I would light a candle and just sit with the candle and say your prayers out loud. Uh, I always, I love angels and it's always a reminder like, oh, the angels can't help you unless you ask them explicitly or tell them that it's okay to help you. So, you know, asking your ancestors, asking the angels, asking the universe, whatever resonates with you to put their power behind, you know, bringing this prayer into your life, bringing this paid in full or this particular amount into your life. And also asking for the lessons that you need to be shown in order to be a person who is ready to both generate and receive that type of money. Yes. And announcing that you are ready, right? Like, I want to know, like, I want the lessons. I want to know what I need to know to do this. Like, I'm not afraid of that information. And, you know, just praying with your candle. Yeah. Yeah. I love this on so many levels, too. And it's funny, too, because this ritual in some capacity has been shared on the podcast a time or two before. But, like, we've been around for seven plus years, hundreds of episodes. Like, it's in the archives somewhere. Um, and I haven't thought about it in literally years. And so as you're saying this, one, you're reminding me of a tactic that I've completely forgotten about. And two, you've added some extra juice to it, which I, I love sort of the evolution of this practice. And it's and now that I'm, you know, a couple of years down the road as well, being able to add sort of a, a wiser perspective to it, there's two things that I want to point out about this practice that I'm feeling as you're talking about it around one, the expansion that this energetically causes you to sort of um, loosen yourself into, right? This, this idea of just sort of putting this out into the universe. And I think this is so important because 
when most creatives in particular are, and really, and or business owners who are struggling with making it happen in the way that they want it to happen, there is this such a sense of lack and um and constrictiveness <laughs> i guess around money that this is this is a practice that will absolutely energetically loosen that energy that you have around money and then also it's requiring you to release control or at least this sense of knowing around when and where this is coming from and how you're going to get it because we're a bunch of type A's, (laughs) 100%. And this practice is really great for just opening you up to opportunities that that you couldn't define and shouldn't because you should be opening yourself up to things you can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. This is that faith, trust, surrender, you know, that a lot of us struggle with. But, you know, you're not, you, you can't see everything. You yeah. just don't have the capacity, the the vantage point to see everything, right? So as business people, we are tasked with, you know, implementing our visions and creating a plan and making it happen and attempting to, um, you know, create an outcome, a specific outcome but there's always something we don't know. And I think a lot of us, you know, certainly people who have been in business for as long as you and I, or even longer, we have all had incidences where something didn't work out and we felt bad about ourselves. We felt disappointed. We felt, you know, whatever we felt, but it was a blessing in the end. And, you know, that's, that's just true. That's just true. Yep, for sure. And also this idea of, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know where things are going to come from. Aren't you glad that you don't? Like, think about how lame our journeys would be (laughs) if we knew the next step every single time. It would be the most mundane existence. I don't want that. (laughs) I can't even, I'm trying to like actually viscerally experience what that would even be like and I I need to sit with it for longer <laughs> like I can't even imagine what that yeah like. I mean for me it feels like boring and how expected and like you know and honestly it feels a little bit like a, a lack of of maybe even free will because like mm-hmm. this path is sort of laid out in front of you and you do it um I I love this idea of really embracing the excitement and the magic and the uh, the like the fun of not knowing where things are coming from. And I love that. I love that this ritual is also just a practice and a recognition and calling in of more of that. Um because that's when life gets fun is when things sort of come out of nowhere and and happen unexpectedly and you're sort of walking through and you have no idea like the energy swirling around you. Um that for that's the kind of existence that I want at least. Yeah. <laughs> so so that- I'm, I'm more magical. This. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, perfect. Well, as we start sort of wrapping this up, I would love to hear if you have any sort of final piece or pieces of advice um, that you would like to give to any creative business owner listening to this right now. I would say that completely surrendering to the reality that you have to get close with your finances, understand your finances, be intimate with your financial information can be, I mean, number one, it's a necessity, but also it can be relieving in this way that we're talking about, right? Like surrender, trust, faith, because it reminds me of like being in a river, you know, and it's like when we're resisting something, it can feel fun, right? Like we all like to go in the ocean and have a wave crash on us or stand in the river and feel the water flow on us, but it gets tiring. You know, resistance is very tiring and things that are tiring are taking our energy and 
you know, all of us need our creative energy. We need our visionary energy. We need our implementation energy. And when we are spending some of that resisting something that we cannot resist, like it is an essential part of business, right? And just in a, even if we weren't in business, it would be an essential part of our individual lives and getting to our goals. Like when we're not wasting our energy resisting, we will be given the gift of that energy like back to us, you know, to do with it what we will. And I think like that's a beautiful gift. So I think sometimes the resistance can even feel like a little bit of self-care. You know, we feel like we're letting ourselves indulge by avoiding things. Yeah. And, you know, who doesn't like a little indulgence here and there, right? <laughs> Indeed. Or a little bad behavior, you know, <laughs> so the bad girl inside of us, like, okay. Um, but it's like, it's kind of self-harming, you know, at the end of the day. And it's, it's not self-care, right? What, what is self-caring is like dropping the avoidance, dropping the resistance and taking your finances seriously, taking you and your finances seriously in, in a way that is, um, like we're saying, involving this aspect also of like trust and wonder and surrender and kind of like, you know, not being in charge of everything. You're not in charge of everything, but you are in charge of some things. So taking control of what you do have control over, which is like showing up to meet the path, right? Like the path is not up to us really, but showing up to meet whatever the path brings, like what kind of shape we're in to show up to meet it. That is what we are in control of. Amen to that. I was literally having a conversation with, uh, with someone the other day. I'm going through a growth phase as well. And they were like, are you not stressed? You know, like what's, and I was like, honestly, the only thing I know I have control over and the only thing I know that I need to do is show up. I just need to like, mm-hmm. I'll show up. The things will happen. It'll get done. I'm not worried about it. I just, I, sh- I control what I can. I'm showing up. So I second that wholeheartedly. That was such a great piece of advice. And I love this idea that, or this fact that resistance is tiring because I think that's mm-hmm. absolutely true. As you said that I, I even felt myself melt a little bit. Um, because it is. And I think so many, so many of us, um, hold resistance in so many ways and, and, and we don't need to. So I, I appreciate that insight. I think that that hopefully just hit home for a lot of bosses listening to this. Um, and I so appreciate you. So appreciate you sharing it. Um, Jesse, Susanna, this has been such a treat. I would love for you to share with the bosses listening um, where they can find more about you and what you do and where they can find this fabulous book. Okay, well, you can primarily find me on my website, moneywitch.com. On that website, there is a page for the book. It has all the links to all the places with the ebooks and the Audible and all of that. Um, it is available anywhere books are sold. And you can find me in terms of social media, mostly on Instagram at money.witch. I have a YouTube channel as well. Uh, which will be dropping a lot of new videos this year. I am on Twitter. I am, oh Lord, you know, all the places. Yes. <laughs> Just search all her everywhere. Places. You'll find, find it. <laughs> but the web, I think the website is, you know, it's all there. Um, I have a money magic shop. So I make uh, money magic products uh, using crystals, gem essences, elixirs, and teas, and all kinds of little friends that can help you energetically in this work. And I have some online courses. All of that is going to be held in that hub at moneywitch.com. Wonderful. And my very last favorite question is what's making you feel most boss? Hmm. I think right now in the release of my book, something that I have been reveling in and that has been really lifting me up is the experience of seeing so much support from my community, you know, like Mm -hmm. all these other business babes, all these other, you know, internet friends that we all have really taking the time to share the book, to talk about like what, um, 
my work has meant to them. And in that, I have really seen, I think, so many of the like little seeds of effort and care and love that I have planted out in the business community come back to me. And that is making me feel just really elevated right now. Yeah. Best feeling in the world. Jesse, Susanna, this was such a treat. Thank you so much for coming and chatting with me about all of this. Thank you. All right, boss, because you're here, I know you want to be a better creative business owner, which means I've got something for you. Each week, the team at Being Boss is scouring the news, the best entrepreneurial publications, and updates and releases of the apps and tools that run our businesses, and is curating it all into a weekly email that delivers the must-know tips and tactics in the realms of mindset, money, and productivity. This email is called Brood. We brew it up for you each week to give you the insight you need to make decisions and move forward in your creative business. Check it out now and sign up for yourself at beingboss.club slash brood. That's beingboss.club slash B-R-E-W-E-D. Now, until next time, do the work, be boss.